Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. Today I have another fantastic lecture from Neville Goddard. This one was delivered on January 15th, 1968, called Live in the Answer. A good portion of this is dedicated to the imagination and the law with some cool new stories. It's always good to find a new, wonderful lecture. Live in the Answer by Neville Goddard. If I title tonight, it will be an invitation to live in the answer. If I can invite everyone who has a dream to live in it as though it were true, I am convinced from experience that gradually and unnoticed, it would suddenly erupt in some objective fact. The fact would be the dream made visible. This is based upon not only one's personal experience and those of others with whom they have spoken. It's based upon an eternal vision, that the spiritual states of the soul are eternal, distinguished between man and his present state, that man passes through states. He passes on, but states remain forever. Man passes through states like a traveler who may well suppose that the places through which he has passed exist no more, as a man may suppose that the states through which he has passed exist no more. The states remain permanent. They are forever. I could this very moment put myself into the state of being extremely poor, and I will not need the help of anyone or government in the world to lose everything that I have and become dependent on society. Or I could, without asking the help of anyone, assume that I am wealthy and without doing anything consciously about it, oh, I'll be forced and compelled into action. I'm not denying that. Or maybe I need not. But the state has its own way of externalizing itself. If I, the occupant, remain faithful to that state, if I get into a state and remain faithful to it, it has its own power and wisdom to externalize itself because I give it by occupancy. So I ask, what would the feeling be like? What would I do if it were true? Just how would I see the world if it were true? Well then, in my imagination, begin to do all these things. In my imagination, just do it. Here is a letter given me this past week. She said, a friend of mine who is a Mormon has said to me time and again, you're always reading the Bible, but you never go to church. And she explained to her friend that she doesn't feel the need for a church. She likes reading the Bible and coming to her own conclusions or looking for parallels in scripture that would parallel her own experiences. Well, one day the doorbell rang, and here's her friend with a group of missionaries from the Mormon church. They've come to convert her. So she said, for a moment I wanted to say I'm busy, but I couldn't do that to my friend. The others were total strangers, they were missionaries. So I said to myself to let them in. No matter how long they remain, they must have a moment when they have to depart, and so I would tolerate it. So they came in and started to convert her. Every time she interrupted them by saying, trying to express an opinion of her own, they silenced her. Her friend said, you know, I'm worried about you, terribly worried. Well, there came that inevitable moment when they had to say goodbye, leaving the one unconverted. She said that night, as I retired, I was thinking of the day, the events of the day, and I wondered how someone could give so much love, such devotion, such sincerity, such time, energy, and money to what I would call reverent baloney. Here, all this devotion to such a false god. So that night, dwelling upon it, I fell asleep, and this was my dream. Now, if you're not familiar with our concept of dreams, let me quote the twelfth of numbers. God speaks to man through the medium of dream and makes himself known unto man in vision. Verse 6. So she fell into this dream. She found herself in a very strange land. She said, it could have been the moon. Just a barren, barren state. All craters all over the place. It could have been the moon from the pictures we're now receiving back from the moon. There was an enormous long roadway, and on it hundreds and hundreds of people were walking, all in the same direction. I inquired where they were going. They weren't going any place. They were departing from, they were leaving the girl. So she inquired, what's the girl? Who's the girl? They said, the haunting girl. Then she asked the question, haunting with what? What's all this haunting about? 
Each told her when she asked. They all gave the same answer. They said to her, the voice, there is a voice within her that is screaming and screaming all the time. So she said, I'm very curious here on earth and I was equally curious there in my dream. So in spite of their one way direction, I continued in the opposite towards the girl. I came to this very pathetic creature, the girl, yes, and here is a voice screaming from her body. I felt sorry. I felt sympathetic. And suddenly the voice is screaming from me and she gets up and she walks away cured and then I woke but I did not lose the lesson how discriminating one must be if I give my attention to anything and contemplate it I will become that which I behold here I am now in sympathy with this state and so I become the very thing I entertained I entertained it and entered that state so my father taught me a great lesson in this experience of a dream that no matter how I think I am awakened in this world I'm not exempt from falling into my unlovely state in the world and from this we realize that we then do not consider whether the just or the wicked to be in a supreme state but to be every one of them states of the sleep that the soul may fall into in its deadly dreams of good and evil when it left paradise following the serpent. Blake, Last Judgment, page 91. So here, the wisest of God's creation is personified as a serpent. Genesis 3.1 And the wisdom of God and the power of God is defined for us in Paul's letter to the Corinthians as Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 1.24. So we will see one personification of this power in the form of the serpent who told man, told woman, you will not surely die. You'll become as the gods, knowing good and evil. You'll go right into a world of death, but yet not surely die. You will seem to those who see your departure and they cannot follow you as one who died. But to you, you have not had the experience of death because you cannot feel yourself die. You're restored in a body, same as before, new, nothing missing, young, unbelievably and unaccountably young because you departed when things were falling apart. You were losing all your senses, losing all your functions, and here suddenly you're restored and you're new. So I say, you will not surely die. And he proved himself correct to those who can see, whose vision is open, and see those who have departed this life not gone at all, but restored and new and young. So here, you fall into a state either deliberately or unknowingly. But what you contemplate, you're going to become. So we think that the world, so you're taught, and all these wise men of the world, they're making their plots and their plans. And they really believe that history is an inevitable progress towards a climax of good in this world. Well, it isn't. The climax has already occurred. Jesus' words on the cross, it is finished, marks the end of one age and the beginning of a new age, an entirely different age. And all are moving into that new age. How true this statement of Blake's is, I have no experience to confirm it or to support it, but Blake treated everything as a man. This house to him would be a man, because everything is barren where man is not. He treated space as a person, he called it woman. He treated time as a person, he called it the eternal youth, male man. So everything to him was man, and man is God. There's nothing but God, and God is man. So here he makes the statement, and he speaks of the play of 6,000 years. And every 200 years, a door opens to Eden. Every 200 years, a door opens to Eden, but the whole play is taking place now. We think it's moving in one direction, and the whole thing is taking place, and there are intervals of 200 years where an individual could enter the new age. Now let me give you a vision of this lady. She said, I went to bed, and I was simply going over the events of the day. I wasn't asleep, my eyes were shut, and suddenly there appears to my inner eye a very long table. At one end of the table here is a judge dressed in black robes and white wig and holding a gavel. I wonder, why am I here or why is he here? But he was looking at me, his whole attention glued on me. Then a voice from within me proclaimed, the incurrent witness, the incurrent witness. She said, I had never heard the word before. It was completely new to me, new as the judge was new. So I simply opened my eyes, got out of bed, and sought a definition of this word. So I went to the dictionary and looked up the word. Well, evidently, it's not an exhaustive dictionary, and she came back with the meaning, which concerned her from the root incur to incur a debt 
or to incur displeasure. So when I got her letter, I too went to mine, but it happens to be the third edition of the Webster's International Dictionary. It's unabridged. This is how the word incurrent is defined in my dictionary, giving passage to a current that flows inward. Then they give you how they use the word. In an incurrent pour on a sponge, it flows inward. Here is a basin of water and you put the sponge there and it flows inward, absorbed right inward and not outward. So the current is moving inward. She is now the incurrent witness. She now by this vision of hers proved to me at last that she has been actually conditioned by divine providence for spiritual communion. Not a thing anyone in this world can do to stop it. And whether she wants to do it or not, she can't help it. She'll be compelled to do it. Because inwardly, she is already awake. And this young lady, she's young. Mother of two small children, she will bring forward a vision after vision to parallel the revelation of scripture. Her scripture only recalls finished history. That's all that it is. The whole thing is done. People think it was done in the past. Then came a break. Then came something else. Blake described it as the written the divine written law of Horeb and Sinai. That's the Old Testament. And such, said he, is the holy gospel of Mount Olivet and Calvary. And it's done. One marks one age, which is this age. And if you know of one condition in this world that man could experience that isn't openly described in the Old Testament, you tell me one. Every conceivable horror in the world is in that Old Testament. Every, well, genocide, we speak of it now with Hitler trying to rub out the Jews. It's all in the Bible. We speak of this, that, and the other as something new. The Old Testament and the other as something new. The Old Testament records openly every crime, every horror, every violence in the most detailed manner. You will think, are there any decent people in the world? These are only states. They are not talking of individuals, they're speaking of states and describing these states in the most minute detail. And the New Testament is the entrance of the new age, where the individual, it's all the individual, it's not collective, it's all the unit, the one moving into an entirely different age. The whole thing was plotted. You read the New Testament, read it as though it happened to one person, read it in that manner as a biography. But know that he's only recording states and that the whole thing is going to unfold in you. But everything said there, you're going to experience. And then, and only then, will you know who the Lord Jesus Christ is, who God the Father is. As we told you last Monday night, last Friday night, pardon me, where he made this wonderful statement and he couched it in a little poem and called it a little boy lost. Well, as you read it, it's a beautiful poem, only six little verses. But what a revelation for those who were not here. This is what he said, not loves another as itself, nor venerates another so, nor is it possible for thought a greater than itself to know. And Father, how can I love you or any of my brothers more? Well, when the priest heard this, he took the little boy by the hair and then screamed with the trembling zeal of the priest, what fiend have we here? And then he burns the little boy as he had burned others before. Well, the little boy is everyone in this world. You come to these conclusions based upon inward experience when you come to the conclusion that you cannot transcend the thinking being. It's impossible for me to actually know a greater than myself. Well, if God, the creator, who created the whole vast universe, wants me to love him and wants me to know him, he has to become me, for I can't discover other than myself. So God becomes as I am that I may be as he is. If he does not become as I am, I am left on the outside because I could never know God. I could not in eternity know a greater than myself, for I am a thinking being. As a thinking being, and if it's impossible for thought a greater than itself to know, well then, let him become me. Well, he did. God became man, that man may become God. Before he became man, he was God the Father. Therefore, if he becomes me, I must one day discover that I am God the Father. If he is a father, then there is a child somewhere, and so you make the discovery of who you are. Until that moment, you didn't know him. Suddenly you meet him, and he calls you father, and there is no uncertainty as to this relationship. So only the son can reveal the father, Matthew 11:27. 27. 
By no other way in the world could man ever know he's God the Father unless God's only begotten Son calls him Father. That Son is personified in Scripture as eternity and contains within himself everything. Now this is the Son who will do all of the Father's will. I have found in David the son of Jess, a man after my own heart who will do all my will. Acts 13.22 He will not rebel. He'll do the will of the Father, the son of Jess. Well, Jess means I am. That is God's name forever and forever. His name is I am throughout all generations forever. Exodus 3.14 And that's the father of David. I have found in David the son of I am myself, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. So here, we put it into this play that's finished, and he plays all the parts. You read the story of David, and you will think, if this is the honored David, the great king of Israel, what a rascal. He sends the husband into battle knowing he's going to be killed so that he could get his wife. Then he simply dances in the nude before the ark. Then he does everything you think man wouldn't do of the noble stature but here is david a man who will do every state play every state and still remain faithful to his father whom he knows to be god in the end he'll reveal everyone in this world as god the father that same david not another david there's only one son and he's going to take every person in this world now there's a lady who isn't here tonight and she hasn't been here since our closing night on the 15th of december but on that night i went back to wish her a few merry christmas and said we would meet in the year i wished her a merry christmas and she said to me neville i want to tell you i've had the first three experiences i said you've had the first three experiences and this is the first time that i've learned of it and you haven't even told me the best well she said i'm embarrassed i said why should you be embarrassed you should be screaming from the rooftops this glorious thing that has happened to you. She said, I'm now waiting eagerly for the fourth, which is the descent of the dove. So I asked her if she would write and tell me. Well, so far she hasn't written, but it has been now a month. She tells me she has had the three as described from this platform, the resurrection and the birth from above, the discovery of the fatherhood of herself, and she's a lady, and then the severance of the curtain of her own body from top to bottom, and the ascent in a serpentine form into heaven, waiting now only for the descent of the dove. And I haven't the letter, but I can tell you, because she told me here the night we closed on the 15th of December, so I don't want to ride her, but I do wish she would simply put it into written form so I would have some record from her. Because I'm only repeating now what she told me in words, but my friend Bob and my friend Benny, they did write it. I have those at home and they are recorded in their own handwriting. I wish she would, and she is a teacher, by the way, a school teacher, X, but nevertheless, she can't say that she can't write. I tell you tonight, you dream nobly, the most glorious dream in the world. It may seem an impossible dream, but you invite it. How do you invite it? By feeling yourself right into it. Go right into it and wear it as you would a suit of clothes so that it feels normal, it feels natural, when it takes on all the tones of reality, all the sensory vividness, you have it, you're wearing it. Then, in a way that no one knows, it will suddenly appear in your world. This suddenness is only, I would say, the eruption of a continuous thing, for it was started in motion when you wore it, and then the suddenness is simply a hidden continuity coming to the surface. If you take this in mind and you dwell upon it, you will see that someone is given credit for this, that and the other, for everything has happened before. The most original thought in the world is divine plagiarism. It's all done. And so you get into a certain mood and you'd be amazed the ideas that will come to you while you're in the mood. If you want to be known in this world, feel that you are known. You'll be amazed how things will reshuffle themselves in your world and then, if you really want the silly publicity of the world, you'll get it. It may not be very flattering, but you'll get it if you want to be known. But whatever you want, assume that you have it, and you're told in Scripture, whatever you desire, believe you have received it, and you will. Mark 11:24. Let no one divert you. Go about your father's business and do his will by simply living in the feeling of the wish fulfilled. Now you try it. May I tell you, it will not fail you. It can't fail you. It's simply a principle, but we are the operant power. 
It does not operate itself. We have to do it. I can tell you from now to the ends of time and you may go to bed night after night still in the old state and never change the state. Now states are permanent. You have to get out of the state. And do you know, I've had moments where just discussing some third matter as it were, a lady came home to discuss one problem and we got off on something entirely different on a higher level. She had this problem with her stomach. She couldn't eat certain foods as they disagreed with her and she'd gone to doctor after doctor after doctor. I took her off that state and we were discussing something entirely different and then I said, let's go into the silence. So we did. Went into the silence on an entirely different matter. She lived, if you're not familiar with New York City, Staten Island is across the river and there's a Staten Island boat, a ferry, that would take, oh, a good part of half an hour to get there. She went over to Staten Island. There's a very large Germanic element in Staten Island. So when she got off, she was hungry and without thinking of her stomach and what she could not eat, she went to a German restaurant and ate all the cabbage and all the sausages and all the things in the world. It didn't dawn on her that she had done this until hours later when she had no distress. No, I'm not a doctor. I didn't give her a pill. I did nothing concerning her stomach. What do I know? I couldn't tell you what it looks like, but here, by taking her mind away from one state and dwelling in another state, she departed the state that had the bad stomach. You can depart any state. The state that has the poverty, the state that has anything, and move from state to state. When you get into a state, may I tell you, it will seem to be the only substance, the only reality. This room is more real now than your home. Your home is shadowy when you think of it. It hasn't the substance that it has now because you're in this state. So if I'm not in a state, if I'm not dwelling in it, it seems a mere possibility. But when I enter into the state, it's the only reality. So Blake said, if the spectator could only enter into these images in his imagination, approach them on the fiery chariot of his own wonderful imagination, if he could make a friend and companion of these images, then he would rise from the grave, then he would meet the Lord in the air, and then he would be happy. You'd rise from this grave. I'm buried in the state now. I get out of one state into another state and another state. And so if I can be the man I want to be, then I am stupid not to do it. But some people would rather sit in a state that they dislike and argue and try to convince you why it is stupid to believe what you teach. Well, if they'll try it and it proves itself in performance, what does it matter what reason tells me? But after they've done it, they may go back. They're told that story in the Bible. He returns to his vomit like the dog. Or Lot's wife, she looks back and goes back to a former state. There are only states, not persons, not individuals. Everything in the Bible is a state. When we speak of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, these are states. And the individual simply is a representative of that eternal state. So you move into a state. But you, the individual, you are the immortal. You are forever. You descended into this world of death and you have the experience of passing through states. No one dies. Not one person in this world dies, really. As he brought it out so beautifully in his own wonderful way of expressing it, he said, the oak is cut down by the axe and the lamb is slain by the knife, but their form eternal remains forever and renews itself by this fiery contemplation. And so you drop now this very moment and you are restored to life. You know nothing of the passage. 99% who go through are totally unaware of what has happened. Those who observe their passage think they died. They are not dead. And they're so overjoyed with what they find themselves to be. Same as before, only new and young and nothing missing. No need of any aid in this world. And they don't even recognize the change anymore than you do when you sleep. If you ever became aware that you are dreaming, you would wake up. So man doesn't wake because he doesn't know he's dreaming. So he passes through the gate and will call it death. He doesn't know that the dream continues and he takes it for granted just as we take for granted in dream. The minute that you become aware in dream that you are dreaming, you tend to wake. The only way you will not wake, may I tell you, it's a very interesting experience. If you find yourself dreaming, prolong it. 
Try to find a solid permanent object. Don't hold an animal no matter how tame he is, but take something that is fixed. I wouldn't take a chair like that. I take a post, a stairway, something that is fixed and hold it. In your dream you can hold it. Now wake up. Wake up without letting go and you'll wake in your dream. The world is just as real as this. Just as real as this. But hold an object that is fixed and then make yourself awake. But do not let go of the object. Then you'll awake right in your dream. May I tell you it's the most interesting experience. Don't get panicky. You'll come back. I've been shut out oh many times and return to this body that is cataleptic. I've been so completely shut out in these worlds that this which I left on a bed or on a chair or on a couch is cataleptic when I return. Can't move it. For a while, maybe 20-25 seconds, and then suddenly I can animate it again. If I didn't get back, they'd cut it up to see why I died, and they'll come to see some conclusion. But if they're honest with themselves, they'll see no physical reason. I just didn't come back. But if you know what you're doing, you won't be panicky. You'll simply find a world just like this, and if you have, I would say, any red blood in you, you'll investigate. It's really a world just like this. The people are just as stupid and they're just as ambitious as they are here. And they all have passions of the world there as they have here. They want to be known too in their press as the best dressed and better than Mrs. Jones and better than Miss So-and-so. They too have the left side and the right side of the street. It's just like this and they're just as sound asleep there as they are here. But while we're here, well, why not play it wisely? I think all will agree it is easier living to have wealth than to be poor. It's easier. You aren't any wiser for it, may I tell you. But I find it easier to have something than to have nothing. I have no desire for oodles of things, but it's easier. Well, if it's easier, then take it. If it's yours for the taking by simply assuming the feeling of the wish fulfilled, well, then what's wrong with assuming the feeling of the wish fulfilled? No power on earth can stop you from doing it. We record in the morning's paper all the things that happen, but they do not record what caused them to happen. Who knows who is dreaming? What happened today? Who knows? Here is a simple story. You must have heard this or seen it on TV. I saw the race. It was the Kentucky Derby two years ago and Willie Shoemaker was riding the horse. I don't recall the name of the horse. I thought it was Swaps, but I'm told it wasn't. Whatever it was, I know I don't recall the actual name, but I do recall the jockey. And this is the story. The owner of the horse had a dream the night before the race. Now this is the Kentucky Derby, the first of the Triple Crown. He had this dream that Shoemaker misjudged the finishing line and rose in the saddle to ease the horse up. If you pass the finishing line, you always rise in the saddle and ease him up to bring him to a halt. Just before you turn him around, he misjudged the finishing line and stood up. Well then, he couldn't get enough energy going in the horse after he realized his mistake and naturally he lost the race. But he was leading by lengths and he was the favorite horse, the best horse. Naturally, the steward set him down for a few weeks or a month because it was a horrible blow to all the people who bet on the horse, plus the millions who were watching on TV that day. I was one of the millions watching it. I could hardly believe my eyes because here is Shoemaker, a truly great jockey, always ahead of the pack at the end of the year. And now, who controlled that behavior? The man told him before the race that he had dreamed the night before. He told him and Shoemaker listened attentively, but in the actual state, he could do nothing about it. He could do nothing about it, therefore, who did it? We took the brunt and he lost income for the next two weeks or a few weeks. I forget how many days they gave him off. Now the owner, Ralph Lowe, had the dream. Did he get out of a state or was he so concerned about the state and in it? But that's the actual recorded fact. So we record the fact and the man who was playing the part was condemned and received his sentence, which was a financial loss to him. But who is the cause of the act? Shoemaker didn't have the dream and the owner of the horse had the dream. Well, I do not have to have a dream at night. I can dream in the day, a daydream, and influence the behavior of others because all are contained in me. Anyway, all that I behold, though it appears without, it is within, in my imagination, of which this world of mortality is but a shadow, Blake. So if all are contained within me, 
I don't need their permission to dream and use them to externalize the dream. He used the horse, he used the jockey, he used everyone to externalize the dream. So he fell into that certainly unknowingly, but he recalled the state and didn't get out of it, and all of his telling and explaining to the jockey did not help. He still lost it in the same manner in which he saw it. Well, you can sit down and daydream the most glorious daydream and put yourself into the dream because it's very shadowy if you're not dwelling in it. But it becomes the only reality, the only substance if you enter into it. So he makes a very strong point of this. If the spectator would enter into, he puts it in capital letters. When Blake wants to call your attention to the importance of a word in a sentence, he capitalizes the word. You would not normally put a capital when writing a sentence of that nature, but he capitalized enter into. In this statement, in Visions of the Last Judgment, calling upon who would change a state to enter into the state which you desire. But if you don't dwell in it, it seems a mere possibility and it's not actual because you're not in it. So here, I would call upon everyone to live the answer now, in confidence that in a way unknown by you and unnoticed by you, it is moving unseen and suddenly it will erupt and become an objective fact to confirm the truth of what you've done. That you dare to take the challenge of scripture, whatever you desire, believe that you have received it and you will. Well, that's a challenge. I think that we are all brave enough to accept that challenge. So if I dare to believe that I have what reason denies, what my senses deny and persist in my assumption that it will harden into fact, well, yes. Well, then try it. Try it and see. In the meanwhile, keep your dream. For your father in the depth of your own soul is speaking to you every night through the medium of dream every night and revealing himself in vision. So share with me your dreams and your visions that I in turn may share them with those who attend here and encourage the faith of all, just as this lady gave me those two experiences of hers. I think it's a marvelous thing, and so I ask her mother to please tell her tonight that incurrent is not necessarily indebtedness. She did not incur a debt there or the displeasure of anyone, but she has now arrived by divine providence at this giving of a passage. She can now become the medium through which she is that passage through which this current will now flow inwardly, and that is God himself. She'll bring forward, oh, she will bring forward vision. She said in one of these, I got up early in the morning, put my little boy into the crib, cleaned him up, put him there, and I was so alive and alive and alert. And it was early in the day. Suddenly I'm beginning to feel why it's late. It must be night. Well, into the night, it's not yet 11. And suddenly I'm feeling the darkness. And I threw myself on the bed, believing that it was really night. Suddenly I heard the little shaking and shaking. It was my daughter. Wake up, mommy. Wake up, mommy. It wasn't yet 11. And I thought that it was dark and way into the night. The room seemed dark. And then when I had this experience, there was nothing but light. I could feel something moving. She used these words. I felt something moving in my skull right behind my head, like a thought that had taken form. Just like a thought moving as though it had taken form, I could actually feel the motion in my head right behind my forehead. Well, she has started all right, and I expect great things from her. So she may frighten others, she may frighten her husband, and she may frighten her mother, but so did Blake. Mrs. Blake said of him, she always called him Mr. Blake. And when this one interviewed him, she said, Mr. Blake, you know, the first time you saw God, you was four years old. You see, she never read or wrote until she met Blake and he taught her to read and write. You were four years old when God put his face to the window and you screamed. Then she said to this man, well, I don't see very much of Mr. Blake. He spends so much time in paradise. And so the man was, and they th thought he was mad, but he wasn't mad. How could you write those poems and be mad? How could you draw his paintings and be mad? But it pleased some because it did not coincide with their concepts of what one ought to think that he was mad. It was in conflict with the rational mind. And you pick up the beauty of Blake and try to duplicate it. When someone criticizes the gospel or criticizes the Old Testament, and you ask the one who is the critic, try to write one verse like it. Just try. You think you're educated and you know how to clothe thought in words? 
Well, try to write the 23rd Psalm. Spend a whole year at it. Try to write any one of the 150 Psalms if you think you're so smart. Write the Gospel of John. Just the first four verses and tell me. Come back with it after a whole year. So I tell you, here is a splendid monument to this eternal picture of God as a play. The whole thing is a play. But all will come out of the play, and when he comes out, know who he is. He's God who conceived it. He's God the Father. And all return to the one God, all. For we are the gods who came down. The word in Hebrew is a plural word, Elohim. So it takes all the gods to form the Lord. Here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Deuteronomy 6.4 So it takes all the gods, every child born of woman, throughout the ages to form the Lord. And you are the Lord, without loss of identity of being a God, because you share the whole, not tonight. Take the challenge of Scripture and assume the feeling of your wish fulfilled. Not only for yourself, you can do it for another. In doing it for another, you are doing it for yourself because really, there is no other. The whole vast world is yourself pushed out. At the end of these lectures, Neville would give two minutes of silence followed by question and answers. Now, let us go into the silence. Good. Now, are there any questions, please? Ina? Question. What is meant by the fiery chariot? Neville says, well, I think that the use of the word fiery is the perfect way to express it. You become so absorbed that it's that one-pointedness. Nothing diverts you. They could scream around you and you're not listening or hearing anything when you are completely absorbed. That's a fiery chariot. It reminds you of the story of Elisha ascending in the fiery chariot. Complete absorption. Any other questions, please? Well, if there aren't any until the next one, that is on Friday. Thank you. And this concludes Live in the Answer by Neville Goddard. So lots of cool new stuff in this. We get some new letters. In this lecture, Neville delves into the concept of living in the end, a cornerstone principle of his teachings. And he posits that by assuming the feeling of the wish fulfilled, even if it contradicts the current reality, you can manifest your desires into the physical world. This concept is rooted in the belief that reality is shaped by the states of consciousness that we occupy and that these states are eternal and unchanging while individuals pass through them. Neville differentiates between a person and their current state, asserting that states are permanent. 
and that individuals transition through various states throughout their existence. He's encouraging us to consciously choose and embody the state that aligns with our desire, suggesting that doing so will allow us to externalize this state itself without the individual needing to force the process. A significant part of this involves personal anecdotes and testimonies from individuals who experience the power of living in the end. One story I found interesting is the story of the woman who has the Mormon missionaries visit her and take of it what you will. Can't say I entirely understood the story about the moon-like existence where she goes to where people are saying the woman is screening from within. If somebody can explain that, I would greatly appreciate it. He's touching on this biblical narrative that interpreting the characters of the Bible as states rather than historic individuals, and that is something that appeals to me. And he illustrates how these states are integral to our journey. We're going through all these states as a part of our journey towards awakening and realization of our divine nature. This is exploring the concept of history and time where he challenges the traditional view of history as a linear progress towards a climax He's suggesting that all of history, including the future, exists simultaneously and that events unfold according to divine providence and the states individuals occupy. Towards the end, he's offering practical guidance on how to apply these principles and encouraging us to assume the feeling of our wish fulfilled to dwell in the desired state and persist in our assumption. And he is assuring us that this practice rooted in in biblical promise will lead to the manifestation of our desires. You can't help but walk away from a Neville lecture in really feeling the power of imagination, this eternal nature of states of consciousness and the potential for us to manifest our desire by occupying and remaining faithful to a state that reflects our goals. I'd love to know what you liked about this lecture. Put your favorite parts and if you have a future lecture that you'd like to recommend, please do so. You can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com, sending and imagining all the love I can for you who are listening. Thank you so much for supporting the channel, and welcome to The Reality Revolution.